Listen, there's something I want us to do before we get any farther. Um, some of y'all know that the world is not a safe place at the moment. And uh, in the course of um, righteous men and women standing up against the kind of atrocities that are taking place, lots of times it's Americans that do that. We were so glad to receive Brian uh, back from the Middle East safely just a few weeks ago. But now we're about to deploy, yes, thank God for that. But now we're about to deploy another of those we've raised from childhood. Abby Wallace is headed for Kandahar here at the end of this month. And so I would like her to stand wherever she is, and I want us to not only pray over her now, I want you to put her on your prayer list. I want her back home safely when this is over. Would you stand, please? Father, we are blessed as a people to know something about the notion of freedom. You have put that in the, the very core of the taproot of this nation. And we who have been transferred here from the nations of the world appreciate the liberties that we share as a people. But there are others, Lord, who suffer under the darkness of oppression. And you place within our hearts the desire for them to be set free. Our men and women are serving around the world as representatives of those who think differently than those who've lived in oppression all their lives. Now, as by your own appointment, Abby moves forward into that area of the world that seems to be coming apart at the seams, we ask for two things, angelic protection and a safe return home. So we ask, Lord, that your grace and wisdom and discernment would attend her, that you would, you would supply every detail that's necessary for her to serve the purpose to which you've appointed her, and that we, Lord, with glad hearts, would hear the good report of what you've done through her as she comes back home to tell us of your mercy. So we extend your hand of protection over her, plead the blood of Christ on her behalf, and take to ourselves the responsibility to lift her up. You are free, Holy Spirit, to call upon us any moment, day or night, for intercession, because you can see all things at all times, and we trust you with this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You know, one of the things I enjoy doing is sharing good reports. And I always like it when a parent comes to me and brag about something. Well, Don Norris just couldn't help herself. She had to let me know that Rachel has skipped her junior year of college and is a senior. I wish someone had shown me how to do that a few times. <clears throat> Also, I want to remind those of you who are evangelistically inclined, you actually care about other people, I'd like to meet with you for a few minutes in my office immediately following the service this morning. Well, I hope by now it is starting to sink in. Father loves you. Father loves you. Now, you know that intellectually, Father loves you. But what happens in here when you step on a rake? Father loves you. He loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And owning that reality is a part of what is necessary for you to engage your destiny. Father not only loves you, he has made a place for you in heaven and in earth. Jesus went to prepare a place for you when you go to the second floor of this thing called God's household. But down here, he has made a place of belonging for you. Do you know how important it is just to have a sense of belonging? I mean, even Brian's testimony this morning, he said, I have found a place of belonging among those who are walking out of the same mess I was in. Belonging is important. Many years ago, I had an opportunity to befriend a, uh, a pastor who has now uh, gone on to be with the Lord. 
But uh, in the circumstances of his ministry life from teenage into, I guess he was in his 50s when I met him, he had been uh, part of a denomination and he and his wife and children were a singing, performing family. You know, the kind that drive around in a bus and go from church to church. Any of y'all grow up around that besides me and Marty? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. And so these guys were very, very popular, sold lots of, uh, I guess they were called albums back then. Any of you children know what an album is? Yeah, forget it. But uh, they had a, a place of prominence in the denomination until something tragically happened. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit and started to speak with other tongues. And suddenly, the doors that had been opened slammed shut. And they were pretty much ostracized from all that they had known. Well, we love your brother. Not anymore. You're always welcome here. Not anymore. All that stuff happened to them. So he planted a church in a farming community where he had been raised in a barn out behind his house on the family farm. And they had been doing a charismatic church in a non-charismatic community for a number of years when I first met him. A mutual friend brought us into the same environment. And there was a circle of chairs where we pastors who were fellowshipping together back in those years were seated. And I said to Maynard, Maynard, come sit in the circle, man. This is where you belong. You're one of us. Some distance into our relationship. I was down visiting him in his situation and he referenced that comment. He said, I don't think you understand how impacting your words were because I had not belonged anywhere for a long, long time. See, there's an aspect about us. We are built for community. And when that is deprived, there's a, there's a genuine need in us to connect emotionally and spiritually with other people because we are designed that way. It is the, it's, the, um, it's the circuitry of our creation. And when the Holy Spirit puts that little battery in there and that thing comes alive, we start to want to connect with others, but we carry with us the baggage that we accumulated before we realized what we were designed to be by the Father. In the course of my life, I've had a chance to watch a bunch of things take place in the lives of people. I, you know, I used to think there must be some, some publishing house someplace that prints how to screw up your life in three easy lessons, and everybody gets a copy. And then they come into my office wanting me to undo what it took them 40 years to create, or 20 or 18 or whatever it is. October at Our Father's House is Community Life Emphasis Month, and I'm going to be talking about this issue of community life for the remainder of um, my time with you in October. There are things about this that have become real to me. Look, um, those of you who've been with me for a while know that when, when, I, um, when I arrived in ministry, I did, a, I did not arrive in ministry willingly nor did I come healthy, but I was called and couldn't get away from it. And in the mercy of God, throughout the decades, he has performed moments of transformational experience for me and given me father figures to help undo the brokenness that characterized my upbringing. So I can, without any hesitation, say to you today, I'm both healed and a father. I'm not a broken leader, okay? But it took decades for that to happen. You just had to keep sowing in the same direction in order for the aggregate of what God will do for you to become manifest in you. There's not a quick fix. You know, when I got saved, I thought it was out goes the bad air, in come the good, happily ever after. Wrong. Whoever's peddling that to you... Uh, Mark returned to sender because that is not how life works. But in the, uh, in the course of our dealing with the issue of communion, uh, community, 
There's, there are things about this that I want to propose we have to engage if we're going to be successful in making the transition from brokenness to healthy representation of the Lord. And the first thing I think is necessary is that you need to be able to reclaim your individuality. Now, you heard Brian share today how he's in the process of reclaiming himself to himself. And that's very, very important. You cannot give to Jesus what you do not own. And if you don't yet own you, you can't give him the real you, the true you. You can only give him the messed up you. Somebody was telling me, I remember who it was and I know who they were quoting, but the statement was this. Most of our testimonies are, this, are the testimony of our immaturity. The stupid thing you did that got you in that ridiculous mess and how Jesus bailed your butt out one more time. Hallelujah to God. <laughs> but when you look at it, it's mostly the immaturity that we've put on display. Yes, okay. Let's put it in context. Now, if you're going to reclaim your individuality, that puts you in a place of health where you can actually begin to consider what it means to belong. If you're broken, all you can give is your brokenness. But if you're healthy, you have something more to give. You have your true self that you can surrender to the Lord. And when you're able to do that, then you're able to embrace the concept of belonging. See, there are many reasons that, that people want to belong. And I'll talk about some of those. I want to read a passage of Scripture. In fact, we may read it together. I'm not sure it's fairly long. And most of you have heard it several times. Now, the challenge in reading a passage of Scripture with which you're familiar is that you tend to go, oh, yeah, I know that. No one knows anything the way they ought to know it. So I'm going to delve into this thing today and try to make life pass through this filter so that we have clarity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul starts, realize, he writes a letter to Corinth basically because they're misbehaving. And a lot of what that letter has to say is correction. And in the first part of chapter 12, he's dealing with this phenomenon called the charismata, the spiritual gifts. One is given this, another is given this, another is given that. And they were competing with one another about the giftings. Now, here's what you need to know about competition. Competition is rooted in the orphan culture. The spirit of competition. When you talk about equal pay for equal work, it's not about pay and it's not about work. The root in that thing is the spirit of competition that I have to be validated equally with you on the basis of my performance. How many of you know we cannot all perform at the same level? Okay? So the spirit of competition is antithetical to the household of God. Because in the household of God, we all have standing. Because the Father gives honor and value to each of us, regardless of our abilities. KDB is not here this morning. Most of you know KDB sits in a wheelchair. She's there as a result of a drunk driver on Christmas Eve when she was six years old. Now she's, she's almost 30. What? 35. Okay, so she's been sitting in that wheelchair dealing with seizures all these years because of a drunk driver. Now, Katie is limited in what she can do. Does Katie have less value than you or me? No. Because God values each of us, applies honor to each of us. We're the ones who start doing the pecking order stuff, all right? But let's look at what Paul's got to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Pay attention to this stuff. Remember, we're talking about community life. So he begins saying this, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now, let's pause. Where is Jesus seated right now? At the right hand of the Father. 
Who is the resident Lord of the church in time and space? The Holy Spirit. Where are the hands and feet of Jesus to accomplish his mission in the earth? Right here. Those who are here, those who hear my voice, and all the other like you assembled all across the planet who know the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, when God looks down on this situation, he sees his son everywhere. Because you're not just Glenn or Virginia or Louise. You are in Christ Jesus. Okay? Sneak up behind Jesus, open the door, and get inside. Because we are the assembly of his person in the earth. So when they look at us, who should they see? A broken Jesus, full of hurts, hang-ups, and habits are those who have been transformed into the likeness of the Father and put him on display. <coughs> Though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body. That is not water baptism. There are four baptism in scriptures, being baptized by the Spirit into the body is one of the four. What were the other three? That's another lesson. <laughs> whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, whether black or white, whatever your culture, rich or poor, officer or enlisted, we are all made to drink of one Spirit. Thank you, son. Now, the body is not one member, but who are the many? If the foot says, because I'm not the hand, I'm not part of the body, is it for this reason any less the part of the body? And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, is it for this reason any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eyeball, it would be death. Paraphrasing. And if the ear says, because I can't see, I'm not part of the body. Hmm. If the whole were hearing, where would be the sense of smell? Now look at this. But God has placed how many? Each one. Who is an each? Are there any eaches here? You look like an each. God has placed each one where? How? As he desires. Have you ever tried to force a puzzle piece into the wrong hole? You ever get the impression that's what you've been trying to do with your Christian life? Just try to make the thing fit because I don't want to be this. I want to be that. You know, the moment we begin comparing ourselves to one another, we start acting like fools. Okay? God has placed... Your father placed you where he desired you to be, which infers he equipped you to be in the place he put you. You've got to come to grips with who you are in him before you can become what we are in him. Because as long as you resist the place of your appointment, you're not going to find this thing humming. You're going to move through your Christian life like a teenager learning to operate a clutch. Now the youngers are going, what's a clutch? <laughs> oh, I miss those days. <laughs> Not. <clears throat> but God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. Now, if all were one member, where would the body be? If everybody was the same, where would the body be? Listen, there is a notion there is a political, ideological notion that equality is important. And in that definition, equality means sameness. Any of y'all remember a guy named Mao Zedong? Remember his garb? What do people around him wear? The same thing. 
What is our problem with, with communism or socialism? Our problem is this. Everyone is equal, but some of us are more equal than others. Sameness is not a goal. Diversity is the nature of God. If, if everybody was the same, then where would be the body? But now there are many members, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, now this is a challenging passage of Scripture right here, so I'll come back to it in a different version in a moment, but read it with me. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow much more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable. How many of you would just concede the possibility that the human foot is an ugly feature? Have you ever noticed the way actresses hide their toes? Toes are gnarly things. And the older you get, the more gnarly they become. So I have gained an appreciation for why they're always painted and decorated. Aren't you glad you don't have to eat with your toes? That was too visual, I get it. <clears throat> Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it, but God has so composed the body, given more abundant honor to that member which lacked so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Now, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. You may find that hard to believe, but have you ever wandered through the dark in the night barefooted and had your little toe discover something? Does the whole body suffer with it? <laughs> Absolutely. Pop quiz, did you pass? All the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are Christ's body and individually members of it. But we are the corporate thing, not you. But you still exist in the body. But we together put him on display. All right, now let me tear into this a little bit. There's some things here. I want to lay hold on. It's very, very important that if you're going to actually walk in your identity in the Lord and fulfill your destiny in Christ, that you own your individuality. Not your weirdness, per se. But that you're able to own yourself apart from any external props. One of my... Uh, revelations over the year. How many of you have ever used or heard the phrase peer pressure? Okay. I finally realized that's a misnomer. It is not peer pressure that gets us in trouble. It's the pressure for peer acceptance. One of my uh, Teen Challenge friends returned from um, a trip to South America. And he was telling me about a gang initiation. If you were going to be a member of this gang, the only way in was to commit murder. And the murder had to be arbitrary. So what you would do is you'd get in an automobile and start driving through the streets with your headlights off after dark. Now, what is some other driver approaching you going to do? Flash their lights. And when you found that car, that good Samaritan, you turned around, you forced them to the curb, and then you had to kill everybody in the car, or you would be shot where you stand. That was the initiation. Now, there are ways to join groups or organizations. <clears throat> That's not my first choice. There are others who are looking for something to believe in. And so when they hear the mantra, honor 
courage, commitment. What comes next? They join, hurrah, they join the Marine Corps. I suppose Leroy Jethro Gibbs ought to be on the recruiting posters. I walked by some youngster today and went to Nozo and thought, oh, he probably didn't know the program. <clears throat> But they join because they want to have something bigger than themselves to believe in. And then you have others who will compromise themselves by copying an attitude toward their long-term friends and buying the in-crowd garb so they can be accepted by the snobs in high school. Be a part of that clique. Now, whatever the journey of self-prostitution has been for you, whatever you've been willing to compromise or put up with or, or subject yourself to in order to belong, whatever that level of brokenness is, somewhere out there in that journey, we awaken to the possibility that maybe my plan is not working. Maybe this is not really satisfying that yearning in me. And so what do we do? In the mercy of God, Jesus becomes a living reality to us. And there's a transformation that happens in our inner man be called being born again. That doesn't mean finishing catechism and, and, and putting a dark spot of ash on Wednesday on your forehead. It means your spirit has been reconciled to the Father by the activity of God, the Holy Spirit. But you come limping in. To the body of Christ. You bring with you your addictions. You bring with you your rejections. You bring with you your anger. Your spirit has been born again, but your soul has to be reclaimed because you don't even know you. One of the things I say around here to those of you, I, <clears throat> the older I get, the freer I am to just say it like I feel it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I can see the exit sign from here. I'm just going to keep saying it. <clears throat> but one of the things I say in great sincerity, and many of you have heard me look at you and say this, I'm looking forward to seeing the whole you. Because I know what goes on here at our Father's house. I know the possibility of you actually becoming your own person. And all those other things you've done to try to prop up the facade goes away. Because Jesus transforms lives through the intentionality of ministries that we host in this house. And I, you know, if there was no other reason for me to attend this congregation, I would come just to watch. The magic of Jesus. Changing you. Healing you. Standing you up inside yourself. And there is a creation we did not see when you arrived. Because he has done his magic. Mm, mm, mm. Now, my position is that this body will receive the guilt-ridden murderer. We will receive the post-traumatic stress syndrome veteran. We receive the prima donna, but we expect you to be transformed and make yourself available to the Holy Spirit for that change. Okay, You will not be allowed to sit here and grow comfortable sitting here. I'm going to do everything I can to tick you off to the point where you want to change. Because the Lord works miracles in people's lives that our Father. Look, there's a lot of things churches do that we don't do, and they're good things, but they're not us. But I don't know many places that have the transformational ministries that go on in this place. Okay? Here's something interesting. Celebrate recovery, theophostic prayer, our prophetic ministry, and healing hearts are led by people who were all discipled by the same person. The prophetic grace that God has given this house permeates everything we do. Everything we do. Now, it didn't happen overnight. 
but we, we just keep sowing in the same direction, and more and more wonderful stuff takes place. <laughs> I've tried to communicate that our Father's house is an inclusive place. It doesn't matter where you come from, what language you speak, what your culture was, what nationality you're from, you're welcome here. And if I mess it up, I stand on right here in front of God and everybody and I repent. You've seen me do it. Because whosoever will may come, but not every whosoever will may stay. Okay? I have a responsibility to you that I communicate to our leadership corps. We are gatekeepers for the activity of God at our Father's house. And when people come in and attempt destructive behavior, I'm going to give them grace to make a decision they want to change, or I'm going to give them the opportunity to reconsider where they want to go to church. Because there's only going to be one spirit in this house. Okay? Now, fortunately, you don't have to deal with that stuff, but I do. <laughs> But when the Lord has restored you to yourself, you're now able to ready, you're ready to receive your placement in him. Okay? Remember what we read moments ago? He said, um, but God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desires. Now, the lack of clarity regarding who you really are forces you to want to be like whatever you think is working. When I was growing up uh, in another denomination, you had five ministry paths. Sunday school teacher, Sunday school superintendent, deacon, minister of music, pastor. And lots of people tried to force themselves unsuccessfully into those career paths because it wasn't who they were. Because the body of Christ, when the, when the Lord places you in it, there's a, a tremendous diversity. Once you're reconciled to him and, and you've kind of gotten rid of the clutter, you can begin to entertain many of the variety. Understand something. When the Bible lists these gifts and ministries and administrations, it's not an inclusive list. It's a hint of what can be. For instance, in, in this uh, very passage above where we started reading, it's, uh, or down at the bottom, it says, God has placed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, then helps, administrations, and various kinds of tongues. Now, do you think that's all he put in the church? No, the point is, there is diversity and variety. Uh, the charismata that's listed just above, you know, um, um, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, faith, gifts of healing, uh, miracles, tongues, interpretations of tongues, discerning of the spirits, the gift of faith. Those things aren't every one, everybody's, but each of them reside in the body somewhere. Ephesians chapter uh, 4 verse 11 says, He got some as apostles, some as prophets, some evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for a very specific person, uh, purpose to realign you. These grace gifts, these Doma gifts of Christ, are designed to reset you back into the ordination Christ had for you, God had for you, in his mind before you ever were. God's not trying to figure out what to do with you now that you're here. He put an imprint on you before you were born and desires that by his spirit you become that representative of his kingdom in the earth. I love that. Since we have gifts... Romans 12, differing according to the grace given, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Each of us is to exercise them. That means if all you're doing is sitting, you're not exercising. How many of you hate exercise? Just be honest. Yeah. Okay. And what happens if you don't? You go from running through a city, leaping on a wall, to Exercise. If you want to grow in the grace, you have to exercise the grace of the gift that's been given to you. If prophecy, according to the proportion of your faith. Thus saith the Lord, my little children, I love you. Well, that's a start. If 20 years later, that's still all you got. You have not exercised to increase your faith. Okay. 
If service in his serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, all of these things, all of these things belong to us. When I sit with people in the orientation class, I tell them, you have a grace in you that belongs to me. Let me have it. Because I have a grace in me that belongs to you. And you're going to get it. Or you're going to get it. (laughs) But we carry something that the Lord has placed on deposit in you because he wants... Y'all know how important it is to have a shadow in a portrait? If you're going to have... I was in a... um, I was in some city years ago, and they, they happened to be hosting a photographer's convention. And so the lobby and hallways were filled with the most amazing photographs I had ever seen. Because it looked like you could just reach into it and shake someone's hand. It was that kind of, before I even knew what 3D was. I mean, this was a long time ago. The nuances that you bring. You know, I I say this humorously to get you to laugh, but the truth is this. Everybody can serve even if it's just as a bad example, okay? Because we have people who come into this fellowship and they serve as bad examples. And they teach you discernment. They show you what you never want to become. And some of them can't be redeemed because they will not yield to righteous rule. And so you learn from them. I don't want to go there. It's, um, it's important that we understand that honor is the coinage of the kingdom. Honor. If you, if you go back to read the Ten Commandments with those lenses, you'll find that honor is the underlying theme of the Ten Commandments. Because if you honor your neighbor you're not going to commit adultery with his wife. If you honor your neighbor, you're not going to steal from him. If you honor him, you're not going to lie against him. If you honor God, you're not going to pick another God. You're going to honor your father and mother because this is the first promise with, uh, first command with promise that you'll live a long life. Honor is the coinage of the kingdom. It is, honor is the basis for worship. Why do you come and kneel down and lift your hand? You're paying honor to God. Honor is the foundation of relationships. How many of you have been in relationships where you knew they were relating to you for what they could get out of you? I have been exploited in relationships. And what it taught me was, don't treat people like that. You know? Honor makes it possible for anyone to come into the body of Christ. Doesn't matter what their circumstances are, their abilities, etc. Now I'm going to reread you that passage of Scripture from Eugene Peterson's The Message. Listen to this. But I also want you to think about this. About how this keeps your significance from getting blown up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it's only because of what you are a part of. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. It's only because of what you are a part of. Is it sinking in yet? An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body but a monster. What we have is one body with many parts, each its proper size and in its proper place. No part is important on its own. Can you imagine eye telling hand, get lost, I don't need you? Our head telling foot, you're fired, your job has been phased out. As a matter of fact, in practice, it works the other way. The lower the part, the more basic and therefore necessary. 
You can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. When it's a part of your own body you're concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed or higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is without comparisons. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, would you prefer good digestion to a full-bodied hair? Bold and edible. Or eatable. Capable of aiding. Self-depreciation is one of the things I run into all the time with Christians. Okay? There are things that we fail to recognize. You may have messed up pretty severely in life, but the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all of that. And if you insist on hauling that baggage with you, you just need to know, those are the DVDs of a dead person, and you ought to bury them the way the Lord did. Forget it. Okay? Don't, don't you think it's good that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses our con sprinkles our conscience from dead works? Look, you still have an amazing capacity to mess it up. Some days you're just astonished how stupid you were. And then you go, time out, God, can we do do-overs? You know? Self-depreciation comes in part because you are unwilling to receive the truth of what the Father says you are in his eyes. And when you refuse to do that, you lie against the truth by exalting your definition of you against his definition of you, and yours always comes out without a passing grade because he ascribes honor to those he loves, and that would be you. If you can get whole so that you're not, you know, I got, I got snookered early in my ministry by somebody who made themselves virtually indispensable. Every time I turned around, I needed something, they'd do it. And as they maneuvered their way into leadership, I found out too late that their motive was not serving the Lord. Their motive was the need to be needed. Now, that's a place of brokenness that drives lots of people because we want to belong, and so we'll make a place for ourselves at whatever personal inconvenience it will require of us, which is quite different from the gifts and graces of God making a place for you. Does cream float to the top? Those who carry grace also become visible. I was talking with one of our folks recently who was in an academic setting that's ministry focused and just reported matter of factly, no self aggrandizement, no self promotion of this. What the Lord has made me became obvious to them. My grace rose to the top quickly. Now, it's not, it's false humility to deny the truth about what God has done in you, okay? I've, I've quit trying to gaff off and laugh away what people say to me. The truth is, I'm a wise man. That's why people call me from around the planet for my counsel. That's why they will submit their plans to me because they want my counsel on it. I was talking with somebody not long ago. I'd never heard this spoken about me, so it amused me. I laughed about it for a couple of days. They called me. They had a little crisis they were working through, and I had a few minutes. I was driving someplace, so, so we, ch we just chatted. And they got to their destination. We're about to hang up. I said, well, I hope I've been a help to you. He said, you know, I'm constantly amazed at the way words come out of you. Now, that's an amusing statement. I'd never heard that before. But it does not serve you to deny the reality of what Christ has done in you, what he has given you. You are supposed to be a person of influence. There shouldn't be anybody else like you in your space. 
There ought to be an example on display, not because you're trying to be an example, but because of what you have become. And when we are secure in that, we can be together without competition and let whatever your grace is be the thing that God calls upon in the moment. One of the things I love about my leadership team is this. We always know which one of us to send. We don't compete to go. This is, you know, this calls for your grace. We need you to address this. You're the one who need because we know one another. We've been living together in the, in the traces for decades now. There are good men and women in this church who are secure when Christ has made them. But eventually, you have to embrace. You have to understand that we are corporate. When God said, let us make man in our image, he's demonstrating God is corporate. And if we come out of God, guess what? We're corporate. Woman was in man. She came out of him. Guess what? Man was corporate. You, you muse on it. I've had a few years to muse on it. You just muse on it. Listen to this. For even as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one, so also is Christ. For by one spirit... We were all baptized into one body. For the body is not one member, but many. But now there are many members, but one. Okay. Now, lest you think I'm myopic, I want you to understand something. I no longer read this passage of Scripture and think exclusively of our Father's house. We are many members in this community. Our Father's house is a part. Bridgeway is a part. Sasif is a part. Faith Bible Church is a part. Grace Chapel is a part. Immaculate Heart of Mary is a part. All Nations Church. Christian Fellowship is him. They're all part of the body of Christ. And if we will quit competing with one another, we can know which congregation is the eye, which one is the ear, which one is the foot, and we can collaborate so that Jesus looks 10 times bigger than anybody imagined. <clears throat> I am so pleased to report to you that we have a handful, a double handful, of evangelical pastors in this county who can see past their four walls to talk about the kingdom and how we should relate together as ministers and congregations. That is so refreshing and so unusual in the history of this town. God is putting his people together. The bones that were separated, that had no sinew, there was no breath in them. God's doing something. And I'm delighted to have lived long enough to see part of it. We have an unusual collection of people here in our Father's house. I did not say we have a collection of unusual people. Don't go there. <laughs> Both may be true. <clears throat> but when we talk about the community, we need to recognize that that word may serve us at one level and spiritual family may serve us at another. I think spiritual family is a good term for some of the people in this house, because every week we've got strangers in here, you know, friends we have not yet met before, opportunities for people to engage who have not had the opportunity before. But in our spiritual house, we've got singles. We've got single again. We've got single parents. We have in childless couples. We have family units. We've got the aging and the young. We have got the spectrum. You know, we, we're beating statistics all across the board. I am 64 years old. That means, on average, this congregation should between, be between 54 and 74. Typically, it's 10 years, plus or minus the lead, lead guys or gals age. Have you all noticed we got a bunch of youngins around here? And more on the way? Our demographic is spread beautifully in large measure, because you have been willing to connect with others. You're, 
You know, I dismiss you guys. I leave an hour and a half later and you're still here. Okay. That says something about the atmosphere of fellowship and community that some of us are enjoying. Others flee the moment the bell is rung. But when we begin to accept, reclaim our healthy individuality, become willing to belong to one another, and then acknowledge our corporiety, then we're willing to be able to hear about the responsibilities that come with that. And you'll be glad to know, I'm not going there this morning, but don't miss next week. All right, let me wrap this up for us. Is this making any sense to anybody? We're individuals, but we need to reclaim our individuality from the brokenness that life has brought to us. And I, I boast in the Lord that transformation of human being lives happens in our Father's house if you'll accept your part of the responsibility to get hold. We're divinely placed. That means you didn't just happen to show up here. How many of you just wandered in thinking, well, I think I'll go visit them, and you got stuck? Okay? It's like you've got Velcro on, the, on your behind and the other parts on your seat. Yeah, I know. I know. I've been trying to escape for 37 years. <clears throat> but the Lord has given us our assignment. You know, I've had invitations to leave here. People have offered to let me go somewhere else. Everybody but God. <laughs> and unfortunately, I have never left my post without being properly relieved. But we're also corporate. What we are together is more powerful than what any single one of us is on our own. Now, some of you are going to be forced to a decision about owning your belonging. Because when you do, it's going to have to change your behavior, change the way you think. I may get in trouble for telling this story, but I love this story, and it's current. One of those <clears throat> who claims me as his spiritual father came to me recently to announce that they had moved out of state. I was kind of the last check on the exit, and I listened, and I, I blessed him in it and said, now, let me tell you this. Your decision-making process is completely consistent with your present level of immaturity. What do you think would happen if today I announced I was leaving in two weeks? Just out of the blue. I've been on the receiving end of those announcements, and I tell you what it's like. It's like being betrayed. It's disorienting. It puts confusion all throughout the house. How could you do this to us? All of that kind of stuff. That won't ever happen because I'm not immature. But when, when people make these decisions, you have to bless them because they're attempting to obey what they understand the leadership of the Lord to be. Now, there's a, another young family that left here uh, a year or two ago against my counsel, but insisted, no, I really believe this is the Lord. They've repented to me twice for not listening. <laughs> what I'm saying is this. When you belong, you don't get to make independent decisions anymore because people have received you. They have loved you. They've made a place for you in, your, in their life, and for you to suddenly say, beep, beep, and you're gone, it, it's like you, you're, you're pulling the, uh, the IVs out, the life-giving transfer between the two, and they're left standing there wounded. But it, it's the Lord to teach both sides of that situation how to respond properly. 
So belonging comes with a price. You know, I, I had to train the, the senior leaders a long, long time ago. I said, look, you don't get to make independent decisions that are going to affect this congregation. Those decisions get made in this room among us because you're not the only voice in this house that they listen to. And we have to decide what is good in God for our responsibilities to this constituency. So there are things you, you'll learn as you start to embrace your concept of belonging. We're divinely placed, so you have to accept that. It's not a matter of, of uh, being an author or an engineer or a, um, um, uh, an instructor in the martial arts or a business owner. Those are just things that come with you. You are what God has designed. The skills you can share. You know, uh, Kevin came and bailed us out the other day when we had that flood downstairs and we were fixing to host a, a funeral reception. We had holes in all the walls because the plumbers tore things apart trying to find it. And he comes running in because he's one of these handy guys and saved us in that moment. We can still do that. But you are the real treasure. What you represent is the treasure of God in this house. And we want that treasure to be on full display. The healthy individual accepting our distinct gifts and graces, we get to surrender our, our individuality, not because we're being lorded over by some autocrat, but because we're healthy enough to give God who we are in the place of our assignment. That makes sense? We're not all there. I know that. Some of you are going to struggle with this. That's okay. Told you I was going to try and tick you off and then you wanted to change. But you need to decide if you're going to belong or if you're just going to attend. It's okay to attend. God will bless you. We'll pray for you. Good things will happen. But if you're going to belong, you're going to become something more than you possibly imagined. You know, if that's the case, make up your mind. Make up your mind. And then dig in with both feet. And let Jesus do what only Jesus can do in you. All right? I want you to learn to connect, not only in this house, but realize your extended relationships are part of God's activity through you. How many of you sit in a cubicle? Whew, boy, do you have greater grace than me. <laughs> I think hell would be a cubicle in the back seat of a car doing 15 miles below the speed limit driven by an old woman who can't see over the steering wheel who's crunching ice. <laughs> but people come to your cubicle. It's your place to adorn. You know, one of my, one of my uh, sons lives in a cubicle. And routinely, he's been there a long time. People know who he is. Routinely, people will come to him and say, can I talk to you for a minute? You know, when I was a drilling reservist, they knew who I was, what I did. And routinely, enlisted junior and senior officers would come to my door and say, you got a minute? They'd close the door and pour their hearts out to me. We represent something. We represent someone. Would you stand? Father, I am so grateful to you for the extraordinary placement of our Father's house in this intersection, in this peculiar community that has international influence down here in the woods. You routinely send us from all over the planet those distinct individuals who either come to us somewhat whole or come to us in the need of healing. And in your mercy, we watch you transform. I thank you for the various ministries that your grace has raised up to help transform the lives of people that you want to see fully engaged in their identity as your representatives and fulfilling their destiny of representing you in the earth. May that continue to be the legacy of our Father's house. And let each of us who have been drinking from that stream of refreshing be willing to offer that cup of refreshing to someone in our extended relationships. Make opportunities for us to be able to testify as boldly as Brian testified today about how God has changed my life and given me hope. 
Connect us, Lord, to one another by your spirit. Show us the love-trust relationships where we can feel safe. Continue to put into our mouths the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, and faith for those around us. And give to us, Lord, the connections that you desire so that we continue to grow up into the full stature and measure of Jesus Christ in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. The altar is open. If you want prayer for healing or other, I'd like to meet with the uh, evangelistically inclined in my office in 10 minutes. Our first-time guests, there's a hospitality room out in the lobby.